Hello and welcome to our Friday webinar. Uh, we are back on with uh, Dr. Tolle with uh, Ask the Vet. So welcome, Dr. Tolle. Thank you for joining us today. Well, 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 uh, welcome and thank you very much, Laura, and thank all of the attendees for being here. Looking forward to some some good questions and uh, on this uh, festive Friday afternoon. I know a little chilly in my parts. Um. Yes, it, it <laughs> is. You know, you know that California weather. You never can tell what it's going to be, right? That's right. My, I think that all the birds here would freak out if it really <laughs> snow. We think I don't. Even, where do where do the wild birds go when it's like snowy? Like where do they all like? You know. Well, I mean, some of them, you know, of course, go to to to, to feeders, and I don't know. They don't. They they haven't told me. But I can yeah. tell you that uh, I know that they fluff up their feathers to make sure that they have all of the, the uh, maintain and keep that heat. They have a, a perpetual down, right, a perpetual down coat that they wear. Um, yeah. but, but it is interesting, too, that um, sometimes when we have birds, we think that our are, you know, where are all these feathers coming from, right? And you look at the bird and it's like perfectly fine. And there's, you know, uh, feathers look great, but it's just still a lot of feathers that go around. And, and then you have uh, you know, budgies in particular, they seem to have, you know, I have three budgies and they make enough feathers for 50 budgies. You're but, right. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, in January, if you have a bird that's outside, even in Louisiana, uh, and, you know, a parrot, I can tell right away it's outside versus a bird that's inside. So, you know, as the birds acclimatize to the, the uh, cooler weather outside, they do uh, have an increased uh, production of feathers uh, as opposed to those that maybe you're inside or uh, in, in warmer climates. So uh, the birds that are outside do have more feathers to keep them warm, which is good. And then on their little feet, they kind of huddle down, they hunker down, you know, and uh, get into uh, an area that's in, within the bushes or, uh, or, or out, out of the wind. So... I know that they're they're fairly smart about that and try to to, to keep warm. Wow! Yeah, this is actually um, the fallout from my budgie. This is not snow. It's just yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. It's, it's yeah. just debris. It's just I need a cage a cage guard a seed guard <laughs> <laughs> or a plexiglass cage or something. There we like go. That. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Still so, feathers get out of that, you know. I know, not right. A, the budgies, you're right. There's the little little people, little little bodies, but a lot of um, a lot of feather stuff going on here. Yes, uh, yes, yes. All right. So we are. Let's see. So we're we are going to be taking questions today. And so anyone who has a question, a reminder to use the Q and A button and not the chat feature, so we can catch the question and all that good stuff. We already have some. We got some piling in here. Are you ready for the? You ready to dive in here on the? Oh yes, yes. Okay. Let's let's. Uh... Uh, see what presents our, our our attendees have brought for us today. Okay, this one out the shoot is from Lori, and she has a 33-year-old African gray with acute vision loss in the left eye over the last couple of months. There's no known history of vision problems or known cataract. Um, she was diagnosed with cataract. Oh, I'm sorry. She was diagnosed with cataract in uh, aritis secondary to the cataract leaking protein. Um, the vision has improved significantly with uh, diclofenic eye drops. Um, can a newly identified cataract cause acute vision loss by leaking protein? Is cataract surgery necessary to stop the ongoing inflammation? And can the protein leakage stop the eye inflammation uh, remit so that surgery is not necessary? Um, she just wants to be able to make an informed decision and also wants to know if there's literature on the topic. So. Sorry. Yeah, there, there. I believe that there's uh, um, uh, a pretty good amount of literature on both lens opacities in 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 birds. Uh, I don't know uh, that it goes into a significant amount of detail, uh, 
Um, but uh, nonetheless, um, that is not an uncommon finding. Um, when birds get old, they get cataracts, they get lens opacities uh, uh, with that. And uh, they, they, uh, it, it's, it's difficult for them to see. And I think I've mentioned that some birds, because they can see at different angles outside of the lens that are not cloudy, that they, they may hold their head intentionally in a certain position so they can see better. So that's one thing that, that can, can occur in older birds. And, 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 and yes, as we've mentioned before, African grays, the average lifespan of an African gray is, uh, you know, from my clinical experience is between 30 and, and 40 years. So you, you, you're basically looking at your, your birds, uh, you know, 33, 34 years old. That's like a 78, 80 year old person because that's our average life expectancy. And as I always say, we know people that have lived much longer and there are birds that live much longer, but the body and, it's, uh, and, and the, the age related changes that occur also occur in birds and, and with cataract formation. And it will uh, actually uh, reduce their ability to see. I'm not really, uh, you know, sure what what your particular bird when you say you know can't see. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that there will be inflammation within that 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 globe within the eye ball itself. Um, but uh, apparently, you are getting in inflammation uh, based on what your your doctors. Uh, uh, has determined a veterinarian with the eye uh, because he has it on diclofenac drops, which is uh, an anti-inflammatory uh, medication that you apply topically uh, to that. And, um, and, and so that may be um, uh, helping. Now, the, the, uh, and, and if that is in fact what's, what's causing it, um, you know, and, and then one of the things that you may want to consider and talk to your veterinarian about is, uh, I'm not sure if you've had an ophthalmologist actually look at the eye and get a, get a specialist to look at the eye, uh, and, and, uh, try to determine, uh, exactly, uh, what they see. I, I'm always, and that's again, one of the, the luxuries of working at a, a specialty hospital. I have an ophthalmologist that I say, oh, you have a lens opacity. There looks like inflammation, which is called uveitis in the anterior chamber. Um, what, you know, let me take it to the ophthalmologist and see if they have an idea through their exam and their knowledge, what may be causing that. Um, yeah, and, and it, it could be lens related, although we don't see much of that based on the number of old birds that we see with lens opacities. Okay. So, uh, it could be, you know, it could be occurring. Um, uh, you said lens extract should, you know, what about cataract surgery? Cataract surgery is expensive. Uh, as you can well imagine, when you make an incision through the cornea to get to the, the, uh, the, the, the lens, um, that what you're, you're going to be looking at is a, a very intricate microscopic surgery to, to remove that lens. <clears throat> um, not a lot of uh, uh, veterinarians have done this in birds, but we have uh, I think we just had that uh, done in a, uh, uh, I can't, it was a larger bird. Uh, I think it may have even been a swan um, from um, uh, uh, the Alexandria Zoo here in Louisiana. But it, it, it can be done and it's been done on macaws, um, but it's not something that, not, that everybody can do. And you'd have to be, it would be an ophthalmologist. And that's where, 
I say go to the ophthalmology specialist to to see if there's any uh, idea of why. It, it, if it is in fact the lens, it may be. Uh, that if there's anything else that that could be done, but the surgery, when I say expensive. It's relatively expensive. I think it may be twenty-five to three thousand, thirty-five hundred an eye to get the lens removed. Now, when you remove the lens, the bird can see better, but again, it's not going to be like you're putting a new lens in as they do in humans, uh, so you can almost see perfectly. Um, but it's going to be better than. Uh, just cloudy, but don't don't think that the bird would be seeing uh, perfectly uh, with that surgery. But they should have sight improvement with that surgery. But again, it's twenty five hundred to thirty five hundred dollars, and an ophthalmologist may go, Doctor Tully, you don't know what in the world you're talking about. It's forty five hundred, you know. But I'm 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 just basing that. And so for two eyes, you, you know, for one eye, that's what it would be. And for two, you could double that. Okay. And she actually had a second, uh, at the end of her question, wanted to know how to find a bird specialist who would do a vet to vet consult with her avian vet um, to get there. Well, well <clears throat> what, what, you would, what she would want to do is talk to her avian veterinarian and see um, who the, uh, ophthalmology specialist that he would recommend, uh, and then and then uh, say that uh, you know she would like to, to 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 get an ophthalmology consult, and 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 then that's how you would that's how you would normally do it. No different than if the bird had cancer and you'd want to talk to an oncologist or a skin problem and talk to a dermatologist. Um, the specialists are out there. Um, but uh, depending on where where you live, uh, the the distance to actually see the specialist may be, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, longer than in other places. I mean, we we have people that bring their their uh, their birds uh, two, three, four four hours away. Um, so. Um, you know, but I would think that within a two to three hour range at the, at the most that you should be able to find a veterinary ophthalmologist that would, that would be willing and, uh, to see that, that bird. Okay. Uh, That's how you would do it through your, your veterinarian to get a recommendation for a veterinary ophthalmologist. There you have it. Okay. Um, and Danielle, I wanted to do, uh, has a seven-year-old Pionis that was just diagnosed with uh, Bornavirus PCR and anti uh, gang ganglicide antibody test was negative. Other tests, yeast infection and crop high WBC, which was at 15K. Crop and fecal gram stains normal, x-rays normal, weight stable. So it seems like the only, the only symptom is frequent regurgitation for years, which has progressed immediately after every meal. Um, the vet suggested multi-drug treatment plan. What do you think the prognosis for developing clinical PDD is, and should she be retested for ABV and AG in the future? That's a that's an excellent question. I, I like it. You open up the package on Christmas morning, and you never know what you're going to find. You yeah. know, and this is a this is a wonderful question. Um, the the answer is we don't know. You know, I, I, you know, it, it's, it's a great question. Uh, what's the chances of this bird um, having uh, uh, or, or developing the clinical disease of proventricular dilatation disease? Uh, and, and, I'll, and all I can tell you is that, um, and, and, and then also the other question is the regurgitation even related to that? Uh, uh, <clears throat> finding, you know, uh, uh, there's uh, <clears throat> uh, a number of other uh, other causes for it. Obviously, you, it appears you have a fantastic veterinarian doing a lot of <clears throat> uh, uh, nice uh, diagnostic tests to try to determine what the cause is and the health of the bird. 
and um, pretty much it's uh, doing well. Uh, I mean, they came back negative or, or within normal, except for that, that Bornavirus test. Um, but what I could tell you is that we have birds that, <clears throat> that have clinical signs of PDD, not only clinical signs of PDD, but die of proventricular dilatation disease. And the pathology, when they do the necropsy and look at the, the bird after death and examine the tissues, um, they, they uh, uh, find and find all, all evidence of PDD um, that is consistent with the disease in the tissues, but they can't identify the virus anywhere. And then of course, there's birds that test positive uh, for PDD and never develop clinical signs of the disease. So that's why that's such a great question um, because we don't know uh, what the significance of that is. Always what I, uh, you know, what you, what you could do is, is uh, retest um, and, uh, and, and, and there's, there's always the, the possibility of just sending it out to the, the same lab uh, or uh, choose a different lab uh, to uh, run the test to try to correlate uh, those findings. Um, and, and it would, um, that's, that's always a question. Do you send it to the same lab? And those, if you have confidence in that laboratory, uh, of running those tests and send it out. But if you are, are unsure, and this goes for any test, um, and, and that's what we teach um, and, and, and try to practice. Uh, if you get a, a, a test result and you go like, what, Where, that does not make sense at all. What's the first thing you do? You retest to confirm that that unusual test result or what you didn't expect uh, was in fact true. Um, and so there's the possibility that um, you could retest. I, I mean, I would, I would recommend retesting, but uh, when you, uh, <clears throat> but there is the possibility that if you retest that it, it, it may be negative. If it's positive, then there is also the very distinct possibility that the bird would never develop clinical signs of PDD. So, so what we're looking at here is a bird that's regurgitating. There's a lot of different things that could cause regurgitation, and I'm sure your veterinarian is looking at that. But um, the weight, the body condition, the muscle, on the bird is, is uh, uh, if that's normal and it's maintaining weight, gaining weight, not losing weight, then, uh, then I would, I would uh, say that <clears throat> the regurgitation is not necessarily correlated to the, 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 the PDD. It may be, but it doesn't by a long stretch doesn't have to be. How's that? That was very, <laughs> very thorough. Um, it's a good question. Yeah. It, it, I wish, you know, it, it's always nice to say, oh, it's positive. Well, just hold on because it's coming. It may not be. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then Jane, Jane has an eight-year-old budgie that seems to have developed arthritis uh, with swollen joints in his ankle. The vet said there's no gout present and has put him on Medicam. Um, is there anything else that can help him with discomfort or additional treatment that you might suggest? So he's used to spending most of the day out of the cage with six others. Is this okay? Should his activity be restricted? Um, the, how old is this budgie? How old is it? He's eight years old. Eight. Okay. Um, 
Well, uh, I would I would say that if the the bird is uh, we're lucky to have meloxicam, metacam. We're lucky. I mean, what did we do 15 years ago uh, for these birds? Um, uh, you know, I've I've seen 40 plus year old Amazon parrots with significant bony changes that are uh, in the joints that <laughs> that's arthritis that's osteoarthritis and uh, we've had um, some of our raptors here some of our hawks uh, that have been uh, older uh, that we've had on meloxicam for uh, uh, a, a, a long period of time because of uh, chronic arthritic uh, development in the long term. And, and so uh, the, the meloxicam is um, really, uh, I guess, for me, uh, your best um, option as it would relate to uh, treating an arthritic condition. And, and, and as far as, and, and, and as far as anything else, I, I, uh, I don't think that there's anything that uh, medication-wise that uh, you know, would would uh, be better. I always always say uh, you 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 use it and and to see if you are getting a response. If you follow me, or if you if you use it, um, you know, is the bird does the bird seem to be feeling better? And if it doesn't feel better, then, then that's something that you would reassess. And how do you know it's feeling better? Does it move around more? Does it seem to be more active, more interactive with uh, uh, the other birds? Um, <clears throat> does it uh, seem more, um, I guess, interactive and uh, alert? Uh, as opposed to just sitting there. I don't want to move. I hurt. Um, so can you tell? That's one thing that you look at. That's, that's called a treatment response. That's a treatment response. You look for that. Um, and, and so if you say, well, if it's not on meloxicam, it just sits there. But if it's on meloxicam, it, it moves around, it goes, it plays, and it looks, it looks happy. It looks like a happy bird. But when it's not, so uh, <clears throat> see, you know, see if it if there's a, a change uh, in the bird's behavior when it's on the medication versus when it's not on the medication. Um, I <clears throat> I have a tendency to say a body in motion stays in motion. That goes for humans <laughs> as well as birds. And so, if you can have that bird remain active that I, I think that it's better for the bird than just trying to reduce the amount of um, uh, activity that that bird, that bird has. Uh, and you want, and that's why you're treating it. You're treating it so it'll feel better that it wants to move around and use uh, its little, little feet and toes as, as much as possible. Kind of like use it or lose it, right? Is that yeah? That's it. That's it. That's it. And 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 it goes. Uh, it goes from birds and 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 of course it can get to the point, like I said, Laura, where you have such a significant bony change in the joints that they just <laughs> they can't move because they're they're locked in place almost. And so you have to modify for those birds, you have to modify the cage and work with the bird because although the meloxicam, which is like a, an Advil or a Tylenol, it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, is that it, it'll reduce pain, but still the bird has difficulty moving around so it gets to the point where it's almost um i would i would say like 
kind of a, a rheumatoid arthritis where you get like growths on the bone and, and stuff. It just can't move. So you have to modify the cage and help the bird uh, get around and be able to eat and drink uh, without difficulty. So that, that comes over time. Okay. All right. Um, and then Sandy, Sandy has a 30 year old severe macaw that started getting red feathers all over the, his body and under the wings where the green once was. Weight is good, maybe a little bit over, a few grams over. Would mixing different pellets cause the color change or any idea what, what, might, what, what that might be? So he flies around, poop looks good. He seems okay otherwise, he's just got these um, red feathers. Yeah, uh, that is a uh, uh, feather feather coloration um, it can be uh, you know just sim simplified. Um, there could be pigment uh, from the uh, as a, you know that's that's placed in the feathers as they grow, um, and then uh, also. Uh, so you say, well, that's what I expect when the, when the feathers come out, there's going to be, it's going to be green or it's going to be blue. Um, and so that's going to be, that's to be expected, but there's also a, a situation of feather color, coloration. What you see is based on the light reflection off of the feathers. So it can be either due to a, uh, a discoloration of the feathers could be due to just the structural integrity of the feather as it develops. Something occurs that interferes with that light reflection to give it a normal coloration and it's not, uh, it's a different uh, color, or it could be due to pigmentation uh, within that feather. Now, um, this is another excellent question. Um, uh, as birds age, uh, they, they can have uh, uh, discoloration of feathers. Their feathers can uh, not as appear as bright as a, uh, you know, uh, a young adult bird. Um, uh, think of our, our, our hair, for instance. Um, as we age, it doesn't, it doesn't go toward the way we were when we were younger. It, it, it kind of uh, gets a little discolored as you age, right? Um, and, and so not, not, you know, the birds may not have discolored feathers, um, but uh, they, the, the feathers may be what you would expect, but they're just not as bright and vibrant as you would see in a younger bird. However, there's other birds, uh, and this could be individual depending on the physiology of the animal, where the feather coloration does change. And, it, and it's not necessarily where there's a, uh, a wholesale change in the feathers. Uh, but you will have individual feathers that would be discolored. And so that is a, a that, can, that can occur. Um, and, and so that's one, one reason that, that it may, uh, you may be seeing these feathers uh, have, a, have a discoloration. Uh, just the aging process of the bird. Um, the nutrition uh, can have a, an effect on the bird's uh, feather coloration. Uh, you may have uh, heard about red canaries. And, and so when you have the red, you know, with red canaries and, and coloration, when they're molting feathers, they feed them a, a color formula that, that when their feathers are developing uh, and, and they, they uh, molt, and they have the new feathers, the feathers come out with a red coloration. Um, so they need that within their diet. Uh, a, a number of, uh, uh, and I know that other people for uh, specifically uh, African greys, uh, they, they have what they, uh, people have called, at least 
around this part of the world, rosy grays or red grays, and they want to increase the red coloration uh, to feed uh, more vitamin A in the, in the diet. And that seems to promote those that have a tendency to have uh, a pinkish feather uh, coloration or redder feathers over their body. Not in, it, it, it can be, uh, it could be more uh, evident in, in certain parts of the body than others, but uh, in general, <clears throat> we're not just talking about the tail here. So uh, diet can have an influence on, on that coloration, the discoloration of the feathers. Now, what you also said <clears throat> was that the, the bird uh, appears uh, to be in good health. Uh, and is, uh, is, a, is a perfect weight, as I recall. Uh, one or two grams, maybe over that, but we'll call it a perfect weight. Um, and, and, and so that goes over to, well, is it a disease condition that may be causing this? Um, <clears throat> that you know, there is, you can look at the literature that uh, some of the feather discoloration has been associated um, at least observationally. And I don't know how much scientific evidence is, is, is behind this, but at least clinical observation over the years has, has associated dark discoloration in Amazon parrots uh, with liver disease. Uh, and so how that kind of relates to the, your severe macaws with the red feathers, as I recall, um, that doesn't really correlate to this, this, this dark discoloration, but I think that a, a number of them is usually uh, more dietary in nature, but liver disease has been, you know, just for completeness here, when you're looking at age related, when you're looking at nutrition, when you're looking at, there is disease conditions that can cause it, but it appears that the bird is, is uh, in, 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 in good health. If you wanna make sure, of course, uh, getting a complete blood count, uh, a chemistry panel with bile acids and bile acid levels uh, are utilized to evaluate the uh, hepatic function, liver function. And if all of those are within normal limits, then I would, I would, uh, in, in which that's what I would expect based on what you're telling me. Uh, there are surprises. It's medicine. You never know. And that's why you do the testing. But I would think in this case, you're probably looking at, at uh, more age, uh, possibly some dietary influences on that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> fascinating. It, it, instead of turning, yeah, someone mentioned earlier that, that the gray is turning, uh, it's turning red instead of turning gray with age, which is kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so David had a question. Um, uh, what do you think about nearly a nearly 20 year old cockatiel that drinks a lot of water each hour, but is otherwise energetic and eats well with no other problems? Is it just normal aging? So the cockatiel is drinking a bit of water every hour. So, yeah, well, <clears throat> and I mean, most of the time when you have birds, you go like, when do they drink? I never yeah. see them drink. I don't know, you know, and if you have a, a sipper bottle, you see it go down and every once in a while, you'll see it licking at the, at the little, little uh, ball or the tube on that. Uh, so, you know, they drink, but you know, it's just like, for many of us is like, well, I don't know, but they seem to get enough water, you know? Um, but in this case, <clears throat> I would say if you're seeing this, this cockatiel drink a lot of water, um, it is a, uh, uh, an older cockatiel. Uh, uh, and, and, and so, uh, there could be something that would be, um, uh, affecting, uh, that cockatiel to cause it to drink water, <clears throat> that much water. If you have a, a cockatiel that uh, drinks that much water, 
uh, then they're probably urinating quite a bit. And we call that polyuria, polydipsia. And I think I've mentioned before, you know, you don't urinate and then drink water. What came first, the urination or the water drinking? You know, I think, well, let's, let's go with the water drinking and then urination, but that's, you know, so that would be PDPU, polyure polydipsia, drinking water, polyuria, urinating a lot, you know, drinking a lot of water, urinating a lot. And so <clears throat> with that, uh, it, it's, it's still where this is occurring, that is not for the most part normal. And so it's not a, what I would consider uh, a normal aging process. What you, you, you look at is what would possibly cause this. And this is where uh, I, would, I would do a, a, uh, one of the, the, the conditions that could cause this is uh, a, a diabetes, okay? Diabetes mellitus. Uh, and so that's when birds can get a high blood glucose um, and they can look at uh, measuring uh, the blood glucose and if it's if it's extremely elevated then that would be an indicator that it is um, a, a diabetic uh, condition um, they can also look if he's if the bird's drinking that much water they can look at the urine uh, what's what's really difficult for us as as bird doctors is the inability to get a clean urine sample because they poop and they pee out of the same area. And so the poop contaminates the pee, okay? And, and because of that, we don't have a clean urine sample. And so there's very few, I guess, we call them analytes. There's, there's very few parameters on a urinary analysis that we can, we can measure that is not contaminated by the poop. One is, however, ketones. And ketones are a byproduct of, of birds that have uh, diabetes. Uh, and so you can measure, if a bird is urinating a lot, you can put a plastic area down and you get what we call free catch. Uh, well, we're not catching it with free, I mean, you know, getting it off the plastic and, and look for ketones. So that also helps validate if it's di diabetic, but I would, uh, I would, uh, yeah, and, and it could be, <clears throat> it can be, um, um, you know, you know, look at diagnosing through a, a blood glucose level or uh, a urinalysis looking for ketones. And that's something with this bird that I would, I would look at. There could be other things, but that's uh, uh, such as uh, nephritis or uh, renal uh, inflammation that may be caused by a bacterial infection. Uh, so I, I think a, a workup would be uh, for that would be indicated. I mean, in some of these cases where we have birds that are drinking excessively due to diabetes, um, I, I can remember, uh, well, it, it, it could also be gout. Gout is another, another uh, where you get uric acid crystals in the uh, kidney. And so you have uh, uh, basically the kidney is uh, dysfunctional, uh, although the bird is looks normal. So if you have uh, even normal blood work, um, but uh, the, the bird is, it's just not functioning properly. Uh, unfortunately, like I said, um, there's contamination, so you can't get a urinary analysis. And so the only way to really kind of determine renal uh, health uh, it, at that point is, is a uh, endoscopic exam and a renal biopsy and with a bird that age and <clears throat> the procedure it would be a very um, what I would say uh, risky procedure for a bird 
to to do uh, an endoscopic exam and renal biopsy at, at that age and and with that bird can be done, um, but what you would be looking at for is uric acid crystals uh, in there. Some of these birds that are are poly uh, uric polydipsic that just are drinking excessively, like you said, it's amazing uh, where they'll just they'll just go through a whole bowl of water, and if they spill any they start trying to suck the water out of the, the, the substrate paper or whatever that's uh, uh, they'll, they'll ball it up and suck it out. And, you know, they're not going to eat it, but you see these little, little sure. paper balls. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's some good ones. Um, our next one is about a 30, a 30-ish Nandy, a 30-ish uh, old Nandy Conyer who's lost some weight. And the vet did x-rays and blood work. And it turns out he has um, high uh, lymphocyte count and we are treating him with antibiotics and uh, mal meloxicam because the vet said that that's most, it, that's most likely it. So they did mention that the high um, lymphocyte count can be caused by cancer. Though in her experience, the vet believes it's much less likely than it would be for like a dog example. So how common is cancer the cause of a high lymphocyte count in your experience i hope i'm saying that right. yeah um the so what what's what's the so the birds losing weight yeah he lost some weight yep mm -hmm. they did x-rays and blood work and uh the thing that showed up was the high um lymphocyte count okay okay um <clears throat> yeah well yeah the um this is this is one of the reasons is uh, why a, a complete blood count is so so important um because it, it can see different measure so many different things uh within a bird even if you don't see it you know overtly the bird is not showing any signs but that blood it, it's a it's a picture window into the inside of that that animal and and so the 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 one thing you mentioned was a high lymphocyte count um and so the question was how often do we see a high lymphocyte count as associated with what with cancer cancer yeah and so is that what it's being treated for right now no it sounds like um um that they're treating them with the antibiotics for the lymphos the high the elevated uh, lymphocyte count but um the doctor said it could it could possibly be a um, caused by cancer, although in her experience, that is much less likely um, to be. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's it's, it's somewhat of a uh, difficult. Um, oh, I think it's being treated for an infection. An infection, perhaps. Huh? Maybe is it being treated for an infection that might be? Well, you know, usually, usually if we see say you you could get an increased lymphocyte count in a viral infection um and, and but if it's bacterial usually we see more of a different cell line that increases um and that would be the heterophils uh different white cell so if it's bacterial that's usually what we see the increase uh and so <clears throat> that's that's what we you know that's what I'm, I'm, I'm you know uh, you know kind of looking at uh, here. Also, what what's involved is is how high is that lymphocyte count? Because um, the higher the lymphocyte count outside of the range is more indicative to me, or has been clinically, if the you know if the um, bird uh, has, has, uh, cancer. It, it, you know, it has, you know, usually it's, it's, uh, well outside of the normal range It's well elevated. 
Um, rarely do, do we see it. Uh, where we can diagnose a, a cancer, not saying that it, it, it isn't, but if it's uh, kind of a just slightly elevated, um, uh, at, you know, relative to the other <clears throat> white blood cells. So, yes, we have noted it, um, <clears throat> uh, extremely high lymphocyte counts uh, in leukemic um, patients. Uh, macaw, I can remember a macaw, you know, that had, had a, a normal 15,000 total white cell count. This one was like 500,000. <laughs> so that's like, that's like in Jupiter, you know, I mean, it's from here to Jupiter. I mean, that's how, uh, how elevated uh, that was. Um, but, uh, but no, so I, I still think that the, the jury would be out on, on this bird and, um, and, and, and may need some uh, continued um, uh, assessment and examination because uh, we've did uh, 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 lymphoma, we've, we've, we've uh, some white cell uh, where you would have your lymphocytes would be elevated. Uh, that would be, um, would be uh, that, that develops over time, where it increases over time. And sometimes you can get uh, different clinical signs with, with these type of cancers too. Uh, we had a, a little, uh, oh gosh, it was a, um, a little parakeet um, that, that had eye issues. The eyes were inflamed. Uh, where we were talking about the eye having anterior uveitis. Uh, well, this bird had it, and it was it was associated with this this, this cancer. So, uh, as I mentioned, there's other things that can cause it. When we're talking about the eye, that's one of the things. So, if it is, then you 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 often have other clinical signs. So 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 look for that, but. Um, if it's not that elevated, then, then it, it, it very well may not be cancer. So there okay. you go. Uh, and then Frank had a question, assuming that I can train him to accept nail trimming, is there a particular brand of Dremel that you recommend for nail trims that are perhaps more quiet? Cause noise maybe might, might freak the bird out, but, um, any quiet Dremel that you might recommend in your, uh, no, uh, I just I just recommend uh, uh, the the variable speed Dremel, um, and and uh, it, it one that you can get uh, a high uh, RPM to get it uh, and and do the 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 nail trim quickly, uh, uh, quickly on that um, for. For the majority of the patients, and I mean, we have owners that don't want their birds sedated. We recommend sedating the birds, and then after we do the nail trim, we give them a a uh, an injection of meloxicam uh, uh, for um, for pain relief, and so they have sedation and uh, uh, pain relief after the the um, procedure. Um, and so that reduces that, that stress that's involved with the, the nail trim. And that is uh, uh, really a, a significant advancement uh, from where we were, you know, 10, 12 years ago. All right. Yeah, yeah. but, but uh, you don't want one that's uh, low speed or you, you can't get high speed on it. You want the, the real deal. And uh, Unfortunately, it does, uh, uh, it does have uh, a noise associated with it, but yeah. Okay. Um, and then Melanie has a three-year-old uh, Solomon Islands eclectus, uh, two, oh, sorry, two three-year-old uh, Solomon Islands eclectus who have been diagnosed with zinc toxicosis. Uh, what can they do to help relieve their symptoms, which include wing flapping, toe tapping, itching, and some plucking? while they are undergoing treatment? 
Well, <clears throat> what you what you have to remember, uh, uh, you know, just you know, and, and, and it depends on how severe these these clinical signs are. So um, it's been diagnosed and uh, getting treated. Um, the the good thing about zinc toxicosis is that that is a uh, micronutrient that the body recognizes and utilizes. It's just like, <clears throat> uh, but as you know, too much of anything is uh, can be bad. And uh, so you can have toxicosis. You need vitamin A, you need vitamin D, E, you know, and K, but you can all, you, you can, you can get all of those toxicoses if you have too much of those. Um, and zinc is a, a mineral, um, but if, if you have too much of it, you can get toxic effects. However, if you don't, if the bird has not ingested a, and, and has a large piece of metal in its, in its proventriculus or stomach, uh, then, then of course, treating it to reduce the levels of zinc in the body, but not exposing the bird to the zinc anymore, the bird will recover uneventfully, okay? Its body will respond and utilize that zinc as long as it's just not piling it on where you're getting increased toxicosis, okay? Um, and uh, as opposed to lead, which is not a, a new, <laughs> it's not something that the body recognizes and we should have no level of lead in our body uh, or birds, but uh, nonetheless, we all do, but they're not at toxic levels. But, um, <clears throat> but uh, so if the bird doesn't have anything in the body, uh, then it you know, no exposure and maybe some treatment to reduce it for a you know down to a manageable level it it will uh, and should recover. Now the question is: this toe tapping, this wing flapping, how problematic is that? Okay, um, if it looks like it's causing injury, then there may be. Uh, sedatives that are sedation something over this time period that can be given to reduce that. Um, but if it's just kind of like, ah, oh, they shouldn't be doing, eh, you know, it's bothering, you know, but if it's really not causing any injury and if it's not um, <clears throat> just kind of, uh, you think, uh, stressing the bird out to a significant amount, then uh, the treatment should be effective fairly rapidly. They, it should turn around pretty quickly. Now, do you, do you see many cases of, of zinc toxicosis? Is it? Uh... You know, it's that, that, that wonderful statement I like, Laura. It's not uncommon to two double, you know, two negatives, not uncommon, you yeah. know. You're not shocked when it comes. Yeah, you know, and so uh, we see metal toxicosis um, uh, fairly, fairly often. One is because birds are curious creatures, right? So they're going to bite off this or bite off that or, uh, you know, tear apart a toy or, tear apart something that they shouldn't have, um, pick up things. I mean, yeah. you, you, you name it, uh, uh, from, from um, mechanical devices to uh, you know, you know, tearing apart uh, uh, you know, die cast models that have zinc in them, little cars or what have you, and, and, and swallow that. Um, so, and, and then of course there's the, like I said, you, you don't see the, uh, the zinc necessarily in the, in the, in the body. Okay. Uh, say in the stomach, but 
you know, uh, there was, uh, you know, uh, they, you know, with just the galvanized things that are galvanized, the birds can, can, can get water, can leach the, the mm -hmm. zinc out of the galvanized and, and they can just be exposed to that, you know, treating a little bit to, uh, to, to bind that zinc to get it out of the body, we call it chelation. And the chelator binds it and gets it out of the body for a, a few days, then it gets down to a manageable level and the body could take over as long as it's not exposed to it. So you would be surprised, you, know, you may be surprised, but we get quite a few um, zinc cases and lead cases uh, every year. Um, you, you, you would, uh, you would expect that we just took out, uh, it was, uh, Dr. Navarez, but it was a, uh, out of the ventriculus of a pigeon, a, uh, roofing screw that was about, it looked like about two inch long roofing screw, how that bird and why that bird ate it, you know, didn't yeah. tell us, but nonetheless, he thought it looked good, you know. Wow. Yeah. A dare. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So there you go. Wow. Okay. Uh, I think we have one, uh, let's see, we have a question from Jane. Let's see if we can get through this one. Um, who has an 11 year old female cockatiel that started to develop odd feathers on one wing. So where there are two, there are two feathers developing in one sheath. Um, one feather develops normally and the second feather is abnormal and doesn't fully grow out. Uh, what can cause that? Is that um, feather ab abnormality? Yeah, you know, it's kind of like a polyfolliculi, uh, uh, not a, a polyfolliculitis, but it's uh, um, where the two feathers come out of uh, uh, the same uh, follicle area, and uh, and 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 so what it could be is it could be a developmental. Uh, uh, problem uh, that just occurred just physiologically, genetically, it just occurred. There could have been some disruption or some trauma to that tissue at the base of that follicle that, that caused that. I don't know if the, it appears from the question that the bird had a normal feathers, flight feathers uh, at this, you know, for for a num uh, you know a number of years and then all of a sudden started having these uh, these the, the two two feathers coming out of the same same follicle and uh, so it could it could it could just develop this way but usually there's some type of a an issue uh, that 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 may have traumatized that germinal tissue at the base of that follicle that resulted in, in this duality of, of, of feathers uh, that, that, are, that are coming out of that. And so <clears throat> then you say, well, what could be done about it? Um, that, uh, and he said one feather's normal, the other. Um, in, in certain situations like this, uh, you know, I would, I would look at uh, possibly doing something to, uh, or recommending to do something to uh, make that, uh, to, to reduce that, that follicle from uh, producing feathers anymore. Okay, okay. Um, we got some, some really good questions as always. I mean, these, you never know what you're going to get on Friday uh, with our Friday webinars with you with the Ask the Vet. And uh, it's a, we cover so many different uh, topics. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of nice to, to see what we get and all these great answers you give everybody, which is amazing. Dr. Tolley, thank you so much. <laughs> well, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, you know, they, they, you know, I try to answer them uh, the, to the best that uh, I can. And uh and sometimes I, I'm, I'm not sure, and I'll let, let them let, let everybody know our attendees and, and then even go back and come back next time with, with what we find out. So um, it, it, uh, it's always a challenge, but always fun 
and, and, and fantastic questions. A lot of nice presence today in the form of questions. Ah, there you go. And if we didn't get to your question today, um, if, you know, if you have it in the Q&A chat, we can capture it. And then, uh, you know, our little, our little elves will just go with the theme. Uh, maybe they can shoot you an answer um, to your question if we didn't get to it today, or we'll answer it in a future webinar with Dr. Jolie. Um, speaking of, we are going to be taking a, a little break um, for the month of January and returning um, in February. So this is, uh, can you believe it? This is our, la our last webinar for 2021. Uh, we end, we end with you, Dr. Tully. So thank well, you. I, I, it, what a year. What a year, Laura. Uh, fantastic. I think this is like our, I mean, our, like this is like our 20th Q, uh, Ask the Vet with you. So you have devoted a good amount of your time on the, on a Friday, no less. So thank you for that. Um, and well, we have more coming up next year. So we got some great webinars. Uh, in well, I, I, yeah, I hope so, because we have so many wonderful attendees from all over the world, uh, all over the U.S. And and uh, and we just uh, we learn together um, and uh, we share together. And, and uh, in the end, we uh, do everything we can to have uh, our birds uh, live a long, happy uh healthy lives you know there you go what we want yeah oh and then you know i get to announce we have our giveaway so some uh we have our winner for today's giveaway and that is pam fuller so congratulations pam that is uh hopefully gonna make your and your birds holiday um a little brighter a little funner a little more festive they get to have some some great uh lefebvre food coming their way and I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play the promo video for as we as we uh, sign out here. From um, this is from Dr. Lamb's um, Amazon Arroyo, who is our our um, enthusiastic product tester, so to speak. Um, so let's see, Pam, you're going to be getting uh, the tropical Nutriberries as well as a package of uh, other Lefebvre food of your bird's choice. So I'm gonna play this video. And uh, once again, Dr. Tolley, everyone is just very thankful that you're able to take the time to do all the all that yeah, all these wonderful answers. Um, yeah, for sure. Well, it's my it's my it's, it's quite my pleasure, and uh, I just want to wish everybody a wonderful uh, Christmas and here. Happy New Year. Same here. All right, here's Royal. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't notice his little friend below, like, hey, give me some. I don't yeah. think he wants it. <laughs> Got a little. One of these. So, yeah. See, there you go. High five. Tropical niche berries. Good boy. A little tropics during the winter months. Tropical <laughs> fruit niche berries. Yeah. Pineapple and mango. Look, Atticus is trying to get some too. <laughs> there we go. That was the product of the month. And, um, some good nutrition there. I, that's making me hungry. I think I skipped lunch. I'll have to go get some food after this. <laughs> All right. There we go. Keep your bird busy. Some nice foraging opportunities. Okay. He's like, I'm doing more. I want I want another Nutriberry. Another tropical fruit. Oh! One more thing. Let's shake. Amazon, they'll do almost anything for food, won't they? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, um, I'm gonna say a very wish, a very happy holidays to, to everybody. Uh, of course, to you, Dr. Tolley, to Brenda, who's behind the scenes doing all the, yes. the really the really intricate work of saying his questions and getting things uh, sent out to people. So um, I just want to wish everybody the end of the, whatever's left in this year. I hope it's awesome for you and your flock, and I hope everyone has a very merry holiday. And um, until next time. Yes. Till next time. All Happy right, everyone. New year. <laughs> All the best to you and your flock and stay safe. Bye. Yes. Bye. Thank you.